So now in this session, I'd like to continue on the Monte Carlo method with a very prominent application, calculating integrals. Well, actually we already did this. Yeah, The expectation was our space average. We had time average equals space average. The expectation is an integral. But a, lim a little lemma yeah, will uh, tell us that this really can be generalized. So let's recall the main aspects of our session on the Monte Carlo method. So the first one is that we recalled what is a drawing of a random variable X. So a drawing of a random variable X is a sequence, you know, if it is a real valued random variable, it's a sequence in R. And this drawing can be modeled by a single event omega of a sequence of IID random variables. So I have an X tilde, this is a sequence of IID random variables having the same distribution as X. So it was this little link that we had between our intuition that later we will look at drawings of a single random variable approximating the expectation and our convergence result. And our convergence result was, for example, this converges to the expectation, but P almost surely yeah, in probability. And the Chebyshev inequality gave us a nice error bound. So the probability that we stay within this interval is prescribed. So we prescribe here, the probability should be larger than one minus delta. And then the interval shrinks as one divided by square root of n. So our convergence rate was here, the one divided by square root of n. So the following lemma allows us to extend the application to use this as a simple integration method. So if f is a function from R to R and xi are iid random variables, then the random variables zi defined as f of xi are also iid random variables. So how is that useful? Well, I have that the average of IID random variables, one divided by N sum ZI. So this here is the ZI converges to the expectation of, yeah, so since there are IID, the expectation of F of X1. So that's my Z1. So if you now interpret our Monte Carlo approximation on the random variables Z, ZI, no? ZI is F of XI. Then I have that this result also holds here for the ZI, which is F of XI. Yeah, and if now my sequence of IID random variables is maybe a special one, namely I consider XI having uniform distribution on zero one, yeah, then you can write the expectation as the integral over the domain. The domain is the interval from zero to one, the value of the random variable. So that's just the F of X times the density the density, if it is uniform, is just one dx. 
So that gives me that the expectation f of x1, so expectation of z1, is just the integral f of x dx. Yeah, and now if you compare the left-hand side and the right-hand side, you have found a nice, very simple method to approximate the integral. So we will, of course, use this by, again, using here a single event. So that means I now consider this on a single event omega. So f of xi is a random variable. If I plug in the omega, then this is a number. Which number is it? It is the number where I evaluate f on xi of omega. So I plug in here the omega. Okay, so these axes here, they are in my script capital axis. These are the random variables. So maybe I can just define this here as a little x, little xi. So then this means I use f on my drawings, little xi. Evaluate f on drawings, little xi on a sequence of random numbers. So this here is a sequence of uniform distributed random numbers. Again, that remark, I have a result that holds in probability. So this holds almost surely. I have an error estimate from the Chebyshev that only holds in probability, but I'm intending an application that will take a look at a single event. Okay, so we have a nice integration method. Just sample the values from the domain space, calculate F on these sample values and take the average. Before I like to look more closely to the Monte Carlo integration, I would like to remind you of a classical integration method. Uh, the reason is that we will see that the convergence rate of the Monte Carlo integration, if we move to higher dimensions, is almost independent of the dimension, except for this little remark we had uh, that generating the vector scales linear in the dimension. And classical integration methods scale exponentially. And we will see by comparison that at a certain level of dimension, for example, here it will be dimension eight, the Monte Carlo is far more efficient. So let's have a look at a classical integration rule, the Simpsons rule, and how the integration moves to higher dimension. So before we discuss the Monte Carlo and integral, let's have a look at the classical integration rule. So that's here the Simpsons rule. And the Simpsons rule is given by the following rule. So here I just take three points to approximate uh, the integral. So the integral from A to B of um, a function so that is here f of x dx, is approximated by the length of the interval b minus a divided by six. And then three points, f of a, four times f of the center point, a plus b half, plus f of b. So, you see that actually this is also an average. Yeah, so you have here a six and then you have one point at the end. You have four points in the middle, four times the middle point and one times the end point. Yeah, so that is also just 
six points. So I'm averaging these six points, but in this special way. Okay, and many such integration methods are uh, well proved, yeah, or the convergence is proved by just considering a Taylor expansion. And if you look at the Taylor expansion of F and you use this special scheme here, yeah, the two endpoints and four times the center points, many terms cancel and we will get a nice convergence order. So that is here the error estimate. So we have a very nice error estimate for this Simpsons rule. So the difference of my approximation, that is here my I, I Simpsons, I tilde Simpsons F of A and B, and the true value of the integral, this is smaller than one divided by 90 B minus A to the power of five times a constant, yeah, and since this comes from the Taylor expansion, this is just the remainder in the Taylor expansion. So we have some uh, force, the force derivative of the function at an intermediate point, yeah? So that's the remainder for the Taylor expansion. So maybe we don't prove this, you can look it up in the internet, yeah? It's, it's an easy uh, derivation that you have this um, estimate. Uh, well, I thought that we, uh, I mentioned that we have a convergence order. That means if I do now a refinement of the interval, so if I add more points, uh, then the interval will get become smaller. So the interval of each individual approximation will get smaller. I will have a sum of approximation, but the interval of each um, approximation will get smaller. So this guy here is becoming smaller. And in the end, we have then a convergence that is h to the power of four, where h is the size of the interval. Well, on the next slide, it will be half uh, the size of the interval. So h is uh, the uh, discretization step. Yeah? So actually also here, the discretization step, uh, we, have, we have already two steps uh, is, um, uh, so 2h is b minus a. Uh, so why is it uh, h to the power of four? Because we have an h to the power of uh, five, yeah? But then we have a sum over all these refinements, yeah? So we will lose uh, one power. Okay, so let's have a look at what happens if I refine this um, interval. So I, I now consider a discretization x zero, uh, x1, x2. Yeah? So consider now um, a discretization of my um, integration domain where I have multiple intervals. Uh, so x0 to x1, um, x1 to x2, x2 to x3. And then I apply the Simpsons rule for two such intervals because I need three points. Uh, so now the name A and B uh, is not the bound of the whole domain. I just consider concatenating these Simpsons rule. So this is called the composite Simpsons rule. What happens if we concatenate the Simpsons rule? I still have the formula here on top. It's now the same formula using A and B for the bounds, but now I will consider A and B to be X zero and x2. So if I do this for all the intervals with even indices, so now the next one is x2 to x x4, then you see that the x2 enters twice. So I need two valuation of the x2. It's the endpoint of the previous approximation, and it's the starting point of the next approximation. So and now I just combine the two. So I would, if I would like to calculate the integral from x0 to x4 by using 
two combined Simpsons rule, I need one evaluation of f at x0, four evaluation at x1, and two evaluation in the middle at x2, and four evaluation at x3, and one evaluation at x4. So I call now this interval length here. So we will call the xi plus one minus xi, we will call it h. This is my step size. And now I combine multiple such Simpsons rules to cover the whole range here from x0 to x10. So then what was previously the b minus a is now the 2h. Yeah? So actually the b minus a half is just the h. So I have an h to the power of five uh, here. But then this is the estimate for one of those guys. So this estimate here with the b minus a is the estimate of one approximation of this partial integral. Yeah? If I consider the integral from x0 to x10, I have now five integrals with the bounds x to k, if you would like. So in the end, if I combine all these guys, we have the following scheme, one function evaluation at the end point. And then it's this funny scheme, but now you see why we have this funny scheme, four, two, four, two, yeah. Four at the odd points, two at the even points. Yeah, the points with odd indices and the points with even indices four function evaluation at the points with the odd indices, two function evaluation at the points with the even indices. And I just take the sum over all these guys. So I take now here the sum over all these guys where the B minus A is actually the two times H. Combined, taking the sum over all these guys, uh, so b minus a divided by six becomes two times h divided by six, which is an h divided by three. So I have here an h divided by three that corresponds to the b minus a divided by six. Then the rule is that I have one function evaluation at the endpoints, x0 and xn. And then I have this funny theme that we have four times the function evaluation at the points with the odd indices. So 2j minus one, and then j starting from one to m half. And we have two times the function evaluation here at the points with the even indices. And what is my um, error estimate? So my error estimate is actually here it was one divided by 90. Yeah, this is something popping out of the Taylor expansion, the coefficient um, h to the power of five. So it was a one divided by 90 b minus a half to the power of five. But now I take the sum over all these guys. So that here would be a one divided by 90 h to the power of five. And now I take the sum over all these guys. So, but the interval that I'm summing here has the length two times h. So actually I get, I lose one h here and I get a four, 
summing over all the two times h's gives me b minus a half. So I have an h to the power of four, and then the whole interval, the sum over all the small steps yeah, of, say, of, of size two times h, the whole interval b minus a divided by 180. So now you have um, the um, integration rule and uh, I now do just a renaming. So the renaming was, okay, I already did that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so maybe you were confused, but I already did that. And this here is now called the A and this here is now called the B, yeah? So rename. We name these points. In the motivation, I was considering the Simpsons rule for a single interval. Yeah, so that was A, B. And then again, the next one was also A, B. And the next one was also A, B. But now, I, since I introduced this uh, discretization, um, I'm integrating from X0 to XM. And now if I call X0 the A and XM the B, then this whole interval here is the interval from A to B. So this is B minus A. Yeah? So you could also write here XM minus X0 if you like. So I have now a rule to approximate the integral of F on the interval from A to B, but now not with three points, now with m plus one points, where some function evaluations are taken multiple times. So I have m plus one points. I have m intervals, but since I have not only starting points, I also have the end points. It is m plus one points. The convergence is h to the power of four. So what is h? So since I choose h as one interval here, my h is the b minus a divided by m. So I use m plus one points. So uh, roughly it goes, the convergence is one divided by m to the power of four. So if you would like to express this uh, convergence rate here with the h to the power of four in terms of the m, uh, you would have using the definition of the h, you would have here something like order one divided by m to the power of four. So I use m plus one points. So roughly in the order of points, it is the number of points, one divided by the number of points to the power of four. If you com compare this to our Monte Carlo method, the Monte Carlo method has one divided by n, n is the number of function evaluations to the power of one half. So it looks as if this classical rule has a real um, advantage yeah? um, due to this structure, yeah? this very uh, elaborated structure, this schemes, one, four, two, four, and so on. It achieves this high convergence rate. And it's with respect to the exponent, it's eight times faster. Yeah? Uh, or the, the exponent is to the power of eight. So the other guy has one divided by n to the power of one half, the square root of n, and this guy has one divided by m to the power of four. Yeah? And m roughly being the number of function evaluation, yeah? m plus one. The picture changes uh, radically if you look what is happening in higher dimensions, at least to this method. And yeah, we will see later Monte Carlo will not change in higher dimension. It will be always one divided by square root of n. So what is happening in higher dimensions? 
So for higher dimensions, so the higher dimensional Simpsons rule, so I'm looking now here in RD, so there is an exponent to the power of D. I need, well, for a one dimensional, I need M plus one function evaluations. For a D dimensional, I need M plus one to the power of D. So you have the same estimate that you get some h to the power of four. Uh, so we have this nice convergence rate, but we need m plus one to the power of d function evaluations. So why is this happening? Yeah, just look at how the method is generalized to higher dimensions. So such a one dimensional integration rule is generalized to higher dimensions by just taking a Cartesian product yeah, of the integrations. So for example, consider two dimensions, d equals two. Uh, consider the m plus one equal to five. So I have five sample points. So I have a coordinate x1 here. So maybe I would like to integrate from here to there. So here, these are my endpoints. This is the A and this is the B. So then in that case, we would use two Simpsons integrations. So that guy here gets the two and that guy gets the two coefficients four. Okay, so you would integrate, you would use this on a one dimension and you would do this for any interval. So any fixed value in the other dimension. So I would now perform the function evaluations and then you repeat this for the other coordinate. So for the other coordinate, you also now have some discretization here. So maybe this here is your uh, end point, let's call it P2. Then this is my center point here. And you calculate now for a fixed value X2, the integral over the component X1. And then you do that for all the other guys. You use these five points to calculate that guy and you use these five points to calculate that guy and you use these five points to calculate that guy and you use these five points to calculate that guy. And then you have all these guys here and you just perform the integral along the line uh, X2. So it means that in order to integrate here over this two dimensional uh, domain, I need five times five, yeah, so five squared. So I need m plus one squared function evaluations. So that's the classic way of doing the integration in higher dimension. And you see that it scales exponentially in the dimension. And suddenly the thing that was an advantage in one dimension, the special structure, you know, the special structure that allows the cancellation is becoming a disadvantage. So the special structure requires that we go in this special structure to the higher dimension. So the Monte Carlo is sampling randomly, so it doesn't have any structure. But the funny thing is that we will see now that this not having the structure is becoming an advantage in higher dimensions. So my next session will be the Monte Carlo integral. And then, yeah, that is very easy. I already introduced the Monte Carlo integral, uh, but we have now, um, say, a definition and um, a theory where we also look at now the higher dimension.
And then I do a code session and we can see uh, also another, um, uh, yeah, and we can see also another advantage of the Monte Carlo integral because the implementation is far more simple. Yeah? The code is so easy, uh, easy to maintain, uh, easy to write yeah, compared to the Simpsons one. So that was it for the session on Monte Carlo integration and we continue on this topic next time. Thanks.